Prior to the 1930s, the macroeconomic policy for the United States government focused purely on tax collection, on the revenue side of it. But in the 1930s, we had a couple of things happen. And whenever this occurred, it started changing the mindset of the macroeconomic policy for governments. These two major events that happened was, the first was the Great Depression. The second one was the Keynesian policy. During the Great Depression, we had a destabilized macroeconomic situation in where a lot of people were losing jobs, inflation was going up, people were not trusting the macro economy, and at that time a lot of government officials said, we need to do something about this. There's way too many people that are unemployed, there's way too many people basically starving on the streets, and as a government we need to step in and do something about it. Well, it kind of set it up for John Maynard Keynes who came up with the Keynesian policy. The Keynesian policy basically states that not only can a government influence the macro economy through the uses of tax collection and through the use of government spending, but it should intervene. So the Keynesian policy came in and said that government should intervene into the macro economy. And the reason that that came about is because John Maynard Keynes said that unlike the other markets, the macro economy does not, is not always a self-correcting process. Whenever it starts spiraling, spiraling out of control, it picks up speed, and it's like a snowball heading downhill. It'll keep picking up speed and picking up speed until it hits the bottom and everything collapses. So John Maynard Keynes said that the government should, not only that they can, but they should intervene whenever the macroeconomic policy is destabilized, and they should intervene using budgets and deficits to help stabilize the economy. So whenever these two things came about in the 1930s, it started adjusting how people were looking at the macroeconomic policies for governments at the time. Within macroeconomics, we view the economy as a continual process of two independent activities. These two independent activities are the production and the consumption side. Well, let's first dive into what is production. Production is the combining of factors of production into products. So it's the typical production that you think of. It's taking inputs and creating outputs out of it. It's taking basically ingredients and creating this product. So what it does is it takes factors of production and turns it into products. Well, what exactly are factors of production? Factors of production are goods, services, and resources that are used in production. And within factors of production, we have four main categories. We have land, labor, physical capital, and then management. So land, that's just the physical space and air that is needed in order to complete production. We have labor, that's often human labor. That's what each hardworking individual is doing, is they're providing their labor in order to develop a product. Then we have capital. Notice that we say it's physical capital. There's two main types of capital. There is financial capital, and then there's physical capital. Financial capital is basically the money that you're putting into the business. That's not what we're talking about here. Although that is important in terms of production, that is not one of the main factors of production. So, whenever we say we're talking about physical capital, we're talking about tangible goods. We're talking about equipment. We're talking about actual buildings. We're talking about machinery and uh, different aspects like that physical, tangible goods that are used in the process of production. Then we also have management. Management is the combining of basically these three factors of production in order to maximize profits or maximize efficiency or anything of that nature. So whenever we talk about factors of production, which we'll reference throughout these videos for this chapter, we're going to be talking about land, labor, physical capital, and then the management involved. And here's the interesting thing about production. Production, for you to produce any kind of product, you need at least two or more factors of production in order to produce a good or service. Think about this. Whenever you, if you're a farmer and you're producing corn, what are you using? You're using land for sure. You're using labor because who else is going to drive the tractor? You are using physical capital. That's your tractors, your equipment that's uh, the seed that goes into it, the fertilizer, you're using all of that physical capital and you're also using manage management. 
in order for you to run an efficient farm, you have to be able to manage it appropriately. So it's often left up to the farmer to manage that field. So the farmer may be providing his labor, but also providing the management aspect. Something as simple as, say, a real estate agent. And we kind of dial back and say, all right, well, we have a real estate agent that operates solely online. It doesn't even have a building that you can actually go in and talk to them. They set up all the appointments online. They go and visit with people at the individual houses or property that they're trying to sell. Well, even then, you still need labor in order for the real estate agent, and you still need management to get it all flowing right, as well as you need physical capital. That might be the car that the person is using in order to get from point A to point B in order to show all the houses. So whenever we talk about production, we use, in order to create products, we need land, labor, capital, management, or a combination of these, and we need at least two or more of these factors. The second continual process in economics is consumption. Consumption is using up something that was produced. We have two main types of goods that go into consumption. We have intermediate goods and final goods. Final goods are goods that are ultimately completely and totally used up by, say, a consumer, an individual consumer. So some, something like a car that a person is driving to and from the grocery store would be considered a final good because that consumer is going to keep that car until it is ultimately completely and totally used up. Another great example of a final good would be a shirt, such as a t-shirt. You're going to wear a shirt until it has holes in it, and then you just throw it away, and it's ultimately used up. Whereas an intermediate good are goods that are going in to produce the final goods. So an intermediate good is like the ingredients for the final good. So if you think about a loaf of bread, what do you do with the loaf of bread? You ultimately eat it up, right? You just completely and totally consume it. Well, an intermediate good would be the ingredients that go into making that bread. So an intermediate good would be like yeast and flour and water and eggs and all of those ind individual ingredients that go into producing that bread, which is a final good because you're just going to eat it up. Now, if we go back to, say, a car example, all of the metal, all of the oil, all of the rubber that goes on the tires, all of the glass in the windows, all of those are basically ingredients to build the final good of the car. So all of those other products that go into building the car would be those intermediate goods. For the example of, say, shirts, the cotton and the buttons that go on the shirt are all intermediate goods because they're ultimately being used in the production of another good. Now, we find that the lines are not always distinct between an intermediate good and a final good. We start getting thrown off whenever we start talking about, say, something like a pickup truck for a farmer. A pickup truck for a farmer is ultimately, yes, it is used up, but it might be used in hauling cattle to and from the farm or ranch. So if a farmer is using cat, uh, the truck to haul cattle, well, then it's part of the ingredients that go into producing those cattle, which is the ultimate final product. Or, but as soon as they take that truck off the farm and just drive it to town to pick up groceries as a normal consumer, no longer as a business deal, well, then that car transitions from being an intermediate good uh, because it's used in the production process to a final good because it's now being used, ultimately consumed up by just a consumer. So what we find is the lines are not always distinct between an intermediate good and a final good. We go back to that bread example. Bread is another good example of it. So if we just basically pull out a loaf of bread and we cut off a slice and we eat it, and we don't put butter or anything else on it, and we just eat that piece of bread. Well, then it becomes a final good. But let's say that a deli is taking that same loaf of bread, and they're making sandwiches out of it. Well, as soon as they start making sandwiches out of it, well, now the sandwiches are the final good, and the bread is an intermediate good. So what I'm trying to get at is these lines are not always distinct. It's not black and white. You can't say a loaf of bread is a final good because it might be an intermediate good. You can't say a truck or a car that is used by, say, a traveling salesman is a final good because it might be used in the production process. So these lines are not always distinct. 